Thank you, uh, Benji, for leading us thus far in our worship. This morning we're going to uh, start a, a new series on the Ten Commandments. You can call it a mini-series or a short series compared to what I usually do because it's only going to cover the Ten Commandments. I'd like to preach ten sermons on it, or eleven maybe, but uh, we're going to start this morning anyway. And um, the reason I want to do this is because of all the texts in Scripture... This is the most probably known and most quoted slice of the Word of God. But it's also the most debated and abused and misunderstand, misunderstood text of the Word of God. For example, when it comes to explaining the Ten Commandments, you might ask someone what they're all about, and, and you will hear multiple views and opinions with many of those views and opinions being incorrect and distorted, to say the least. A very common and religious idea of the Ten Commandments is that they are, well, a religious set of rules, a list of do's and don'ts, and that depending on how good you are at keeping them, well, that will depend on how good you are in God's books, or something to that nature. In other words, keep the commandments and God will be good to you. A bit like Santa Claus, you know, that myth. If you be good, Santa Claus will give you something. Others would say that this is a Jewish law and only for Jewish people. Wrong. Some even hold that our response to the Ten Commandments determines God's acceptance or rejection of you. A little naive. And can I say wrong again? And, and then we have the Christian slant to it. And sad to say, there are also many debates and opinions, and some are wrong and distorted to say the least as well. So many would relegate, Christians would relegate God giving his law as he did in the Ten Commandments as being irrelevant to the church and even irrelevant to this modern day and age. And you may have heard this in cliched form. I've heard it. Actually, I grew up in these kind of circles. It'll go something like this. But we're under God's grace as revealed in the New Testament. We're no longer under the law as revealed in the Old Testament. Wrong again, can I say so what I want to do today and throughout the series is, is point out what the law of God is all about in its historical context and, and explain, hopefully, God willing, why it is relevant to the church and to each and every one of us today. But before we do that, by way of introduction, I want this morning to highlight the theological context of this historical occasion that goes down here. Okay? We'll get to that soon. The detailed context of this whole narrative that leads up to the Ten Commandments or the giving of the law, as we may prefer to call it, is found in the five books of Moses, what we call the Pentateuch. It's if you want to get all the details. There it is. You've got to read the whole five books. But the main context is emphasized succinctly for us in chapter 19 of Exodus, before we even get to the Ten Commandments or the law given in chapter 20 and the details right through to the end of chapter 24. As a matter of fact, chapter 19 of, of Exodus, it serves as a preamble, can we say, to the Ten Commandments given by God through Moses to the children of Israel, which is seen in the following chapter and right through to the end of chapter 24. What this does is it informs us, what chapter 19 does, it informs us as to the purpose of the commandments, as well as, well as giving us the right perspective we should have toward the Ten Commandments. So simply put, understanding the context of chapter 19 is critical to, for understanding the relevance 
to us today of the Ten Commandments in chapter 20. So we can ask the question, well, what is so important about chapter 19? Well, we're going to read it. We're going to read it. Follow me, Exodus chapter 19. And we'll read that through to the end of the chapter. So we're not going to get into the Ten Commandments today because I want to emphasize this context, okay? I want to sort of feed you some motivating truth from God's Word so that you'll be hungry for the first commandment and the following. Chapter 19 of the chap- of Exodus. In the third month, verse 1, in the third month after the sons of Israel had gone out of the land of Egypt, on that very day they came into the wilderness of Sinai. And when they set out from Rephidim, they came to the wilderness of Sinai and camped in the wilderness, and there Israel camped in front of the mountain. Moses went up to God, and the Lord called to him from the mountain, saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob, and tell the sons of Israel. Verse 4, You yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians, and how I bore you on eagles' wings, and brought you to myself. Now then, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be my possession among all the peoples, for all the earth is mine." And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the sons of Israel. Verse 7. So Moses came and called the elders of the people and set before them all these words which the Lord had commanded him. And all the people answered together and said, All that the Lord has spoken we will do. And Moses brought back the words of the people to the Lord. The Lord said to Moses, Behold, I will come to you in a thick cloud so that the people may hear when I speak with you and may also believe in you forever. Then Moses told the words of the people to the Lord. The Lord also said to Moses, Go to the people and consecrate them today and tomorrow and let them wash their garments and let them be ready for the third day. For on the third day the Lord will come down on Mount Sinai in the sight of all the people. Verse 12. You shall set bounds for the people all around, saying, Beware that you do not go up to the mountain or touch the border of it. Whoever touches the mountain shall surely be put to death. No hand shall touch him, but he shall be surely stoned or shot through. Whether beast or man, he shall not live. When the ram's horn sounds a long blast, they shall come up to the mountain. So Moses went down from the mountain to the people and consecrated the people and they washed their garments. And he said to the people, be ready for the third day. Do not go near a woman. So it came about on the third day when it was morning that there was thunder and lightning flashes and a thick cloud upon the mountain and a very loud trumpet sound so that all the people who were in the camp trembled. And Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet God and they stood at the foot of the mountain. Verse 18. Now Mount Sinai was all in smoke because the Lord descended upon it in fire and its smoke ascended like a smoke of a furnace and the whole mountain quaked violently. And when the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder, Moses spoke and God answered him with thunder. The Lord came down on Mount Sinai to the top of the mountain and the Lord called Moses to the top of the mountain and Moses went up. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, Go down, warn the people so that they may not break through to the Lord to gaze and many of them perish. Also let the priests who come near to the Lord consecrate themselves or else the Lord will break out against them. Verse 23, And Moses said to the Lord, The people cannot come up to Mount Sinai for you warned us, saying, Set bounds about the mountain and consecrate it. Then the Lord said to him, Go down and come up again. You and Aaron with you, but do not let the priests and the people break through to come up to the Lord, or he will break forth upon them. So Moses went down to the people and told them. May God add a blessing to his word. Shall we pray? Father in heaven, what an amazing text of an historical account. But Lord, as we look at these words and we look at this, this story, this account, this historic occasion, Lord, open to us truth from yourself and teach us, we pray. These things in Jesus' name we ask. Amen. The first point I've got up there this morning is that the Lord makes an announcement to his people. And we do see this in the first six verses. He makes an announcement. But what I want you to do this morning, as much as you're 
sanctified imaginations will allow is to pretend to be one of the Israelites standing at the foot of Mount Sinai on this historic occasion. And I will even be making references, especially in the early part of this message, I'll be referring to us and we and our as if we were there, okay? And so I think it's really necessary for us to do this in order to bridge this historical gap of three and a half thousand years, years give or take a year or two, uh, so that we can enter into what God is laying down here and bringing before the people. So here we are before the mountain of God in the wilderness of Sinai. And it's been three months since we left Egypt. And here we will remain, according to Numbers chapter 11, for another 11 months around this mountain. But it is at the strategic point of our journey that we're about to see with our own physical eyes God's covenant ceremony, can I say. This is where he is going to establish, where he is going to affirm or confirm his promises and his presence and his blessing that he has already promised his people from way back in Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And so we all know and recall and can recall other covenant ceremonies where God has been physically active in. He's not necessarily physically active and demonstrates his presence in uh, uh, the way that we'll see here. For instance, you will see him in Genesis 7 where God was physically active in putting a rainbow in the sky and promising Noah that he would never flood the world like he did on that occasion again. Another one is in Genesis 15 where we see God appearing as a flaming torch and a smoking oven as he walks through the divided sacrificed animals that were ordered on that day. And that's where he promised Abraham and his descendants a land of blessing. But here, for the very first time, God will enter into an explicit open covenant relationship with an entire nation this has never happened before folks he will affirm his covenant with his people and try as you may you will not find anything paralleled for this in any other religion in the whole entire world ancient or modern There is only one God in the entire world who has ever covenanted with his people. And you know who that is? It is God, the Father, the God and Father of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, he is our God, folks. And and the Lord of hosts is his name. He's the God of Israel, as we have sung of and mentioned in our affirmation this morning. What great encouragement we can take from this in our age for us this morning. In this age of... Tolerance, syncretism, and pluralism, where, where, where truth and error are so fused and muddled. We can take great encouragement that the God and Father of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, is our God. And he has covenanted with his people. This is the motivating backdrop to the truth and the standard God's standard that is laid down in his law. This is the motivating truth for us. Oh, wow, this is our God speaking, and this is our God talking to us and giving us instructions to be guided and led by. But the first important thing I want to to draw your attention to here this morning is this, that it's God's grace is the background and context from which his law or the Ten Commandments spring from. You got that? The grace of God is the backdrop, it's the background where the law, his commandments spring from. In other words, we see in this section how the Lord emphasizes his redeeming work before he gives the law known as the Ten Commandments. Now we often, people so often, more than often, get that back to front. He does this in verses 1 and 6 and especially verses 4 to 6. Because in verses 4 to 6, he emphasizes, what does he emphasize there? He emphasizes how he has brought his children out of Egypt. And he uses uses that endearing expression, and he's bore them on eagles' wings. And you will all know how a certain breed of eagle, you know, when 
the chicks get young, the, the, the mother throws them out of the nest, and they plummet down, not knowing how to fly. And then the mother eagle comes just before they go splat onto the ground. And they land on her wings and she bears them. And she carries them all the way up to the nest again. And she will keep doing that until they learn to fly. That's the imagery here. This is the kind of eagle that God and his word has in mind here. He has borne Israel on eagle's wings. In other words, it's the Lord's work. He has done this. He has done this. He says by way of reminder, You have seen what I have done to those who held you in bondage and have carried you like an eagle does her chicks to protect them from harm on their training flights. You have seen that. Yahweh says, I have done this. You have not contributed to this redeeming work. It is my undeserved grace that has brought you thus far. This is what God is saying here to Moses, to the people. He did not say to them on that day, if you obey your, my commandments, I will bring you out of Egypt. He didn't say that. He says, look, I've already done it. I've already redeemed you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. When you were fearful at the Red Sea, I stepped in and gave you life and a safe passage. When you complained about having no water and no food. And when the conditions got tough, I stepped in and I protected you and I provided for you on every step of the way. If it had been left up to you, God is saying here, you would never have got this far. You would never have got to Mount Sinai. I redeemed you. I saved you. I brought you to myself. Now therefore, now therefore, here is my word, here is my commands for you to obey and to live out in response of thankful worship. That's what God's saying here in this passage. So please get this, folks, please get this. Even here in the Old Testament passage, and right throughout, this is, this is where it is really clear, the grace of God and redemption gives us the background and the framework whereby we can understand the proper use and function of the law in our lives. Okay? That brings us to our second point that God, that grace in God's redemptive plan always precedes his commands. This is what this section tells us. In other words, in both the Old and New Testament, God never uses his law or his commands to dispense his grace. Like many religions would teach and practice. Many religions say, yeah, okay, you've got to do this, you've got to do that, you've got to do this, you've got to come to confession, you've got to come for the priest, you've got to do this and this. And, and, and just maybe God will think kindly upon you if you do all those things. That is law before grace. False law anyway. God never does that. His law is not the way in which people are saved. And we can go to Romans 8 and 20, 20 and just cut all the explanation out because Romans 8 and 20 tells us clearly that no flesh or no person will be justified in God's sight by the works or keeping of the law. That's Romans 8 20. His law is not a, a 10 step standard for us to earn our salvation. I want to be very clear on that. The 10 commandments are given by God to his redeemed people of all ages to all those who have been transformed by God's grace and are being conformed to his image. That's who the law of God is for. Even this, these ten commandments, which we're focusing on now, they're our guide. They are a measure of holy living that God's people can live out as an expression of worship and gratitude for the Lord's redeeming grace. And so this is why understanding chapter 19 of Exodus is essential to have a right take in order to have a right take on chapter 20. Now, as we look at verses 5 and 6 here of chapter 19, in its historical context, the casual reader might be tend to or might tend to think that the if word there puts a, a condition on this grace blessing deal. But this is not the case, as we've already seen. Why? What have we already seen? We've already seen that God has already redeemed his people. They have already been brought out of Egypt and been brought to God himself. We see that right at the end of verse 4. They already knew the saving grace of God described in the eagle's wings imagery. 
the blessing of God's grace and favor has been dispensed upon his people with no conditions attached. So what is this that we have in verse 4 and 5? Can I suggest that what we have here is a reminder that privileged relationships always carry with it responsibility. Do you get that? I like to see it a bit like getting married. Brett, you're going to get married, God willing, this year. That's for your design anyway. And, um, and as he know, and as all married folks know, or should know, that being married is a privileged relationship. Is that right, Bill? It is, the privileged relationship. It is a privileged relationship because, not, we, not because we thought it up, it's because it's a relationship of God's design. Okay? It's a, a specific relationship of God's design. And so when a man and a woman come together, not a man and a man, that's abhorrent to, to God in the Scriptures, or a woman to a woman, but when a man and a woman come together in, in marriage, it is a, a, a relationship of God's design, and so therefore it's a privileged relationship. Now, but that human relationship, as we all know, will only blossom and bloom as each spouse responds appropriately to the privilege of being in relationship to one another. Is that right? It will only blossom and bloom and be what it's meant to be as we respond appropriately to what that relationship was intended for. So what this means in our text is that our grace relationship with God is a done deal. The relationship has been formed. We are already his possession. We are already his kingdom of priests. Peter chapter 2 verse 9 in the New Testament bears this out, by the way. What does that say? But you are, he's speaking to believers, those who have experienced God's grace in their lives, but you are, present tense, you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people of his own possession. Done deal, right? What for? Why? Why is that happening? Why has God done that? The next verse, part of the verse. That you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. There you have it. Same truth, same principle, same idea in New Testament as we have here in Exodus 19. In other words, folks, the wedding has taken place. And by God's grace, we are in relationship with him through Christ. The wedding has taken place. What a glorious privilege. And we can rejoice in that. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. And you can think of hundreds of texts that would bear this out of the wonderful privilege it is of being in a relationship, personal relationship with God. And now, therefore, now we need to respond appropriately. We need to demonstrate our gratitude. We have the blessed responsibility to respond in order as Christians, as believers, as God's people, as his possession, as his kingdom of priests. We have this privileged blessing of responding so that we might blossom and bloom as God's priests. You got that? As a holy separate people in his, this world for his glory and name. So Moses is not saying here, keep the law and you'll become a super spiritual disciple or an elite missionary. Moses is not saying that. Moses is saying rather, keep God's law and you will be exactly what he made you for. You got that? Keep God's law and you will be exactly what he made you for. He made you, what for? To be a treasured possession, a kingdom of priests, a holy nation, you were redeemed by grace to worship, okay? You were redeemed by grace to worship. Okay, I think I might have gone too far here. Um, yeah. That's where we are, right? Bottom point. So how do we do that, Moses? You know, we can, how, how do we do that? How, how do, we, do we blossom and bloom like this and, uh, and to be what God has made us to be? How do we begin to... To, to walk that path? How do we begin to live that life? Well, we need help on this, right? I need help. Well, if left up to me, you know, I, I, be, I'd be absolutely hopeless. I would fail every, every, every time. But God in grace has given us all we need to accomplish the task, folks. He has. The answer is responding appropriately, as we've already discussed. And what is that? 
obeying the commandments as we have in chapter 20. That's what the Ten Commandments are. They are God's guide for priestly and holy worshippers living in His world to become what God wants us to be. Representative priests as we keep His commandments. The next section is in verses 7 to 15, we see that the people prepared to meet God. And um, I couldn't help being impressed when I came to this section with the fitness of this 80-year-old man, because that's how he was probably 80, he, may have been a, he would have been a little bit older. Uh, he was up and down and up and down and up and down that mountain. You know, as I even read it, I'm starting to sweat and puff. But... Just thinking a little bit more deeply on that, we do know that this was all to do with preparing Israel for the most important strategic meeting the nation has ever had thus far. You see, they were a beat, about to meet God as a nation, as a community of his people. You see, Moses related what God had said in verses 4 to 6, and what was the people's response to what Moses said and what, what God had told them? Uh, they said, all that he has said that we will do. They were really keen to respond. And, uh, and they did that out of faith and obediently. I, I just love that. And, and notice how even in their keenness to respond, they didn't even know what he was going to command them to do yet. But they said, all you have said that we will do. And so they were going to be taking it. Whatever God you want us to do, we're going to do. Oh, we know that they failed. But don't we all fail? That doesn't delineate the fact that we should be those who are responding appropriately. You see, they, the following verses here tells us of further preparation because there was going to be a third day. So obviously they had a day between or two days to prepare themselves and on the third day God would meet with them. And so the first thing that they had to do, that they had to consecrate themselves, that is they had to set themselves apart. Uh, also in the mountain, the mountain that was to be treated and consecrated uh, as something that was holy. And so they, they had to wash their clothes, they had to abstain from intimate relationship with their spouses and, uh, and things like that in order to consecrate and be wholly set apart to God. And so all this tells us of the, uh, of the, the seriousness, the awesome seriousness of being in God's presence. And, and setting the boundary around the mountain with borders, uh, that was to, to stop mere inquisitive gawking spectators which is casual of reverence toward God that's what that want. that's what the idea means that's their whole idea stop people gawking just for the sake of inquisitiveness no heart intent they were just God didn't want that that's a reverence and so this really does tell us something of the seriousness of being in God's presence. You see, the people were not even allowed to touch this holy mountain where God would display something of himself. They weren't allowed to touch it. Such casual curiosity is deemed sinfully irreverent by God, folks. you know that? And as I was thinking of this, I thought, wow, by the way, this kind of irreverent casualness, it's been exposed and dealt with before, we might remember in Scripture. Remember Yuza, with good intent? He was one who was walking up beside the ark on this new cart, and it got a bit wobbly, and he reached out and touched it so it might not fall off, you know. Boom, take it down. Casual irreverence. Same thing happened to Moses. Moses, speak to the rock. What did Moses do? Gets out a stick and he whacks the thing. Casual irreverence. And because of that, he never entered into the promised land. But why was it irreverent to touch this mountain? The answer is clearly given in our text. The mountain was to be constituted a holy mountain. A mountain was set, a gar set apart where God would meet with his people. He was due to manifest himself to Moses and to the Israelites here. You know, just like the ground, you know, remember when Moses met God in the wilderness when his, in, his, in his 80 years of training or his 40 years of training and out in the wilderness and, and God saw this bush burning and what was God say from the burning bush? Take off your shoes from your feet for where you stand it is holy ground. Same deal here. This mountain was holy. God chose to make it holy. 
And my dear people, we can learn some really important principles from this and lessons from this. Because if casual irreverence is such a serious sin, can I suggest it is a sin that we need to be much more aware and sensitive about in our own lives? I know I do. The reason being is that our churches and our, our personal lives, including myself, are so infected with the casualness and irreverence of our culture that what it does, it morphs into our lives and therefore we lack a right sensitivity and a conscience toward the holy things of God. That's what happens. And everything about God's redeeming grace is holy, folks. You got that? Everything. Coming to church is a holy setting. The home is a holy setting. Your witness and testament in the workplace is a holy setting. You are a holy person. Your body is something that God has redeemed for himself. So you are to treat it as holy. It's to be set apart. Not to be treated with casualness and irreverence toward God. Everything about God's redeeming grace is holy. We dare not treat it lightly or casually. How do we treat it? With the uttermost reverent obedience. So how do we do that? How do we treat the things of God as holy when we should do? I'm going to say it again. Chapter 20, Ten Commandments. Have it all. A little insight into the first commandment. You shall have no other gods before me. Wow. Just if I left the message here this morning, that would be enough for us to dwell on, right? May we learn and do as the old hymn writer once said, take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to thee. Amen. Okay, and thirdly, God introduces his sermon to his people. We see this happening in verses 16 to 25, right to the end of chapter so he's going to preach a sermon. He's going to bring truth before the people. And now he is about to introduce. The people have consecrated themselves. They understood, understand that this mountain is a holy place of God because where, this is where he's going to meet his people. They're not to be irreverent. They're not to be casual. And so now God introduces his message. You know, in most homiletic classes, and I've been in a few of them over the years, um, you will get homileticians or the professors saying that if you have not gained your congregation's attention in the first two minutes of your message, you've lost them for the entire sermon. You would have heard that, right? Hence, many pe preachers, and I don't necessarily agree with this, many preachers will revert right at the beginning of the message to funny antidotes or stories or whatever, and, and they may have nothing to do with the, with, at all with the message, all in order to gain your attention. Anyway, on studying this chapter here that we have, I think I've finally come to the place where these homileticians, can I say, got their idea from. They got it right from this section of Scripture. You see, God himself is about to preach the most significant and impacting and far-reaching sermon to his people from this mountain. Matthew Henry, that great theologian of the past era, he said this on this. Never was there such a sermon preached before or since as this which was preached here at the church, to the church in the wilderness. God himself was the preacher. His pulpit, pulpit, or rather his throne, was Mount Sinai. End quote. Matthew Henry. By the way, God loves mountains. you know that? Do a study on all the mountains in Scripture. It's unreal. The first one I came to think of was where Jesus preached. His sermon on the mount, right? And so it's, it's not insignificant that God kind of picks out mountains, and uh, he certainly picked out another one here. And anyway, um, here God introduces his sermon, uh, and that sermon, by the way, begins in chapter 20, and then the details of it after chapter 20 right through to the end of chapter 24. And he introduces it with a spectacular pyrotechnic display that would and did make Elder Park on New Year's Eve look like a boy playing with matches. It really did. It really does, yeah. It's as if God is saying, what I'm about to say, listen up, folks, what I'm about to say is majorly important. Never before or since has God manifested in himself in such a spectacular way as he does here. Not in Old Testament history or even in New Testament history. He never will 
until the Lord returns in glory. God, as it were, is stamping here his, his personal signature, can we say, to the sermon that he is about to preach in Exodus 20 to his redeemed people. So let's not miss the importance of this, this incredible sermon introduction. It almost seems that God, what he does is he summons all the forces of nature to salute their creator as he manifests himself to his people at Mount Sinai. That's what he's doing. But of course, this was no mere attention-grabbing ploy that we might use, right? It was not something that he was using to stop his hearers falling to sleep, which I wish I could use now and again, but there you are. Mind you, you've got reason to go to sleep when I preach. It's far more important than that here. Because amidst all the thunder, the lightning, the fire, the smoke, the quaking mountain, uh, the increasing trumpet blast, God is telling his people something vitally important. What he is communicating in this credible sermon intro is two main things, and I want to just touch on these. He is telling his people that he is big. You get that? He is telling his people and reminding them that he is big. We need reminding of this, you know, folks. He is telling that he, him that he is a consuming fire, that he is the almighty God, that he is king, that he is a judge, that he is matchless, that he is invincible, and he is above all other gods, and so therefore we ought to fear him. That's what he's saying here by this majestic display. God is teaching us that he is an awesome God and therefore drawing near to him should be to his people an awesome thing. How big, how awesome is your God, folks? John Piper once accurately identified a major problem in the church. And this is some years ago now. And this is what he said... The man, the creature, is big in the church, and God, the creator, is small. How true that is when we see how a celebrity culture has swept through the church, where man's needs have become paramount, and what God wants of his people have become mere secondary and small. God has become... Small in our eyes, he has become small, sad to say, in comparison to our needs being met, our wants being satisfied, our differences being recognized. Man is the creature, is big, and God the creator has become small. What an indictment that is on God's people, folks. What an indictment that is on my own heart and my own life. And here in God's sermon intro, it seems that God is communicating, I want to make my redeemed people never, ever, ever to make that mistake. May we see and know and trust and fear our God because he is big, he is awesome, beyond compare. Do we acknowledge that in the way we live? I wonder if we do. The decisions we make, in our relationship toward one another, in the church, in the home, do we see and value God being bigger than our problems, our needs, our temporary theological differences, the issues that we might have towards others? When our God is big, folks, all the temporary issues of life, no matter what they are, begin to take on their right place. You agree with that? Wow, this is a shake-up call to me when I'm studying this text. I can get so wound up and tired about things and then often my wife, my conscience, second conscience has to remind me, but Jeff, in the scheme of things, in the light of eternity, when we look at God, I said, yeah, it becomes nothing. So get on with it. Our God is awesome. Why? Because he's God. That's why he says, you shall have no other God before me. Commandment number one. 
So we ought to fear him. That's the first thing we learn from this great section. And secondly, the other main thing is that he is telling us in the sermon intro that his be- a mediator is essential. All the way through this section, it's all about Moses going up and down, up and down, up and down this mountain and speaking with God and then speaking to the people, speaking with God and speaking to the people. And it's clear that what that God is saying, what God is saying is here, and he's sending out a message in all this action, in all this action, you know, he doesn't have to say, but you can see with all this interaction with Moses and himself and it's going up and down, what God is saying is, Moses is my man and he's your mediator. He's your walking and talking Bible, so listen and obey him, because when he speaks, I speak. That's what God's saying here by all this interaction. You see, Moses was hand-picked for the job. It reminds us of someone else, doesn't it? It reminds us of how Lord Jesus was a chosen one before the foundation of the world to do what he, God called him to do. So imagine, here you are, trembling fearfully at this awesome display of God's majesty and power and glory, and you are not allowed, or would you even dare touch this mountain? But there is Moses, a man just like any other man. He's going up and down and up and down and even speaking to God. Imagine the clout that this would have given him in the eyes of and the minds of the people. Oh, wow. Here's a man that God has chosen. He's doing things that we cannot do. Why, if we even touched the mountain, we'd get fried. But yet Moses goes up and down and up and down and speaks with God. Moses is not killed. And so God is saying, he is my man. He's your mediator. You need him and you need to listen to him. My word, does not this say something about the authority of God's word that it was passed through Moses? Now, one of the people listened to Moses and revered him and treated him as God's appointed minister and chosen vessel. You see, for the people to walk in God's ways, they needed to listen and obey the words of Moses, which will be made plain in chapter 20. And the same today, folks. Let's just bridge the gap here a bit, the historical gap. For people and for you to walk in, for myself to walk in God's ways, what we do is must listen and obey God's word in the scriptures as it has been God-breathed. Just like Moses spoke to the people what God says, we read the word of God and it is the same power and the same authority. 2 Peter 2.20 says, it is God-breathed, the scriptures are. And so just as Moses was God's mediator to the Israelites, Jesus Christ is our mediator between us and God. Remember what Jesus told the disciples when he was transfigured on that another mountain? God said to the disciples, This is my beloved Son. Listen to him. They weren't listening up to that day. Peter was rushing around, oh, let's build the tabernacle, you know. One for Moses, one for Elijah, you know, let's build. He he was all action and didn't allow his heart to resonate with the solemnity of the moment. God says, this is my beloved son. This is my chosen. This is my mediator. Listen to him. He is the only God-appointed mediator whom we must trust and obey. Yet people by the millions, sad to say, Try to break through. Can I use that expression? Remember, God says, do not break through. Do not break through. Touch the mountain. Otherwise, yet there are millions who try to break through, try to reach holy ground. They try to bypass the one chosen mediator in order to be acceptable to God. And their eternal doom is, and can I say it this way, they will get fried. The point God is making in our text here is that there is only one way to come into my presence without being judged is by a mediator. That's what he said in this chapter 19 and that's what he's saying in this day of grace through Jesus Christ our Lord. Many put their good living, their money, their moral standards, their religion, they put them forward as mediators. Maybe not intentionally but ignorantly but that's what they do. 
as their idea of access to God. But listen to what God's only appointed mediator, Jesus Christ, said. This is what he said, and I'm going to finish with this. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man, no one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus is our Moses, can we say, right? Moses is a type of Christ. Folks, we deserve God's wrath. But God supplied a mediator in Christ. And we are to listen, we are to heed and to obey his voice, his words in faith. Why? Because we cannot enter into his covenant. We cannot and dare not and haven't the, do not, should not have the audacity to claim his promises or to live, endeavor to live in his God's way apart from coming to God through Jesus Christ, his mediator, by faith. Trust God will add his blessing to his word and that your appetite is whetted somewhat for our first message next week on commandment number one. Shall we pray? Yeah, Heavenly Father, we do bow before you. And Lord, we don't come presumptuously or irreverently. Lord, we want to come before you acknowledging our unworthiness, but at the same time praising your name for your grace that we have experienced through faith in Jesus Christ. What a blessing, what a privilege to be personally related to to the person of your dear son and to be your children eternally blessed as we've already heard being given eternal life what a privilege help us to respond appropriately and to blossom and bloom in the things of God and to live as you intended us to live take us to our homes in safety and may your blessing upon us each one be in our lives in Jesus name we pray amen